tell me the truth. Are you not mesmerized? Are you are chills not going up and down your skinny little spine? What do you do all day? Not a goddamn thing. When was the last thing you did anything over there at that studio? Never. Well, you never do a again. goddamn thing but sit around and what? bitch about women's genitalia. You what? guys are did you, did you disgusting and need to get off the radio. Jake, you're... The Jake Pentland Show uh, with Jake Pentland and, of course, Jen. How are you doing, Jen? I'm great. How are you, Jake? I'm tired. I- I'm going to try and be professional. I mean, I'm definitely going to be professional. Uh, and, and put on a good show, but these first few minutes are going to be a little tough for me. I had to get up at uh, 4.30 to take my wife to work, and then I've already done the martial arts class, and then I came back. Only have and, one car? Uh, Only I, one car in the house? No, we have two cars. But, um, you know, my wife's a flight attendant, and I, I don't, if she drives to work, it's not like our jobs where you can just pull in and uh, walk in. She has to park in a restricted lot and then take a bus and it's like you're already flying at 5.30 in the morning and doing a six hour flight and dealing with a bunch of assholes on the plane because people are so mean to flight attendants the least uh, I could do to help is just drop her off at the airport you know she can walk right in sweet. on our nice suite yeah um, or controlling <laughs> yeah a little bit contr- yeah I want to make sure she's not talking to people um, <laughs> I do see we have a caller Jen um we don't have a screener today. We've been ditched again. There's no Eli or Mike or Jeff or uh, James was the guy that helped us last week. It's his birthday. Yes, it's his birthday. So if you are calling to get on, hopefully uh, Jenny Ketchum calls. Uh, Jen will be screening, which will be difficult because I don't think she's ever done it. So <laughs> I haven't. Uh, so bear no, with us. I know us. what to do. I know okay. what to do, I think. Do you know how to open the chat room? I don't. I don't know how to okay. do it. Good. Awesome. Is it not chat. open? No. Um, I'll okay. open it. I'll okay. open it while we talk. That, that'll be that'll be a challenge. But can you check with the uh Yeah, so I'll check right now. Uh, anyway, so welcome to the show. Sorry, we you know it's enough for us to try and do the show on our own when we don't have help. Uh, you just have to be a little bit more patient. But yeah, anyway, I'm waking up. I'm getting excited. Uh, we have a lot to get to today. Hopefully, our guest calls in. Uh, Jenny Ketchum said she was going to call blind. Um, I have no idea what that means. I'm imagining she means, um, you know, when she feels like it or gets to it. Uh, so normally I, I plan these kinds of things and schedule, tell our guests to call at a certain time, and then uh, we schedule around it. But today she could be calling now. That could be her, or she could not call at all. So that's that not, is thing not her. That's not her. Okay. Um, so anyway, J- Jenny Ketchum. Um, talk a little bit about she used to be a porn star named Penny Flame. She was on Dr. Drew's uh I guess sex rehab. It's a spin off. That guy's got more shows than anybody. Well she was on Celebrity Rehab first. Right. And then and went to the spin off sex rehab and the halfway house after. Gotcha. So you've probably seen her. Um and since then that's what I want to talk to her about. She I guess the therapy worked enough that she's quit porn. Uh, and she's become, you know, an author of sorts. She wrote a book um, called I Am Jenny. She does a, a blog called Becoming Jenny. You can check it out. And she's also a contributing um, a writer on the Huffington Post. So she's doing well. Everyone, by every account, she's she's a legit writer. So it's it's quite a turnaround to go from porn to author. So anyway, she'll be the one calling in whenever she calls blindly. Um, that will be exciting. Also, our dear friend Billy Gordon, uh, who a lot of you don't remember, I don't know if you do, he used to call on the show a lot. He uh, he was a great guest back when we were in AM, but since then, he hasn't been calling out of this show. He does his own show. He actually does two shows on Sunday on this, this website. He was in the hospital and admitted yesterday. Um, I see that's him on the line, and I just want to check in with him. And since, since Jen, Are you there, Billy? I'm here, Jake. How are you? I'm doing good. You haven't, we haven't talked in a long time on the air, so I'm excited to have you back. You you were um, you a regular caller, I guess? Yeah, I was. I loved doing your show, but then, you know, Saturdays became my day when I did my um, chores, and I went downtown to buy my fish and fresh vegetables and came back and did all my house cleaning and stuff, and I would always look up, and it would be like after the fact. You know, your show would be over. And so now that I realize it's at 1 o'clock, for some reason in my mind, I thought it was at 11 o'clock. And um, that's just because 
Well, let's face it, I lived through the 70s. But um, <laughs> You've been practicing this, huh? The That's truth is, I must have offended yeah. you somehow with one of my awesome uh, You know things. what? Don't flatter yourself, honey. <laughs> <laughs> you did not offend me. Okay, it's a, you know that's impossible. No, and it's it's nice being on here with you because I love I love talking to you on the phone, on yeah, the uh, radio. Yeah, I do. We had some and good talk. Billy Billy was the one. For those of you who don't remember, we had uh, the last time Billy was on my show, uh, we had Peggy Hell from NAFA, the National Advancement of Acceptance of Fat Americans or whatever, that hung up on me. And Billy was great on that show. Uh, so that was the last time I think you were on. But anyway, welcome yeah. back. What, what well, happened? You, you had some heart? Yeah, I'm in the hospital. Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I'm in the hospital. There's a team of people wrapping this lymphedema right now as we speak. These girls are working hard. and um, Yeah, but um, and they're fabulous. They're all fabulous. And they're spoiling me. But, yeah, I just had, you know what, I have atrial fibrillation, which is something that happens to people either when you get old or it's, it's sometimes it can be a consequence of, you know, obesity and other things. And it's just an irregular heart rhythm. It makes you really tired. And the danger of atrial fibrillation is when you go from an irregular heart rhythm into a regular heart rhythm, you can have a stroke. And that's what happens a lot of times. But easily be um, controlled for by being on a blood thinner. And so, which I'm on... Okay, yeah, go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, so, anyway... Um, I saw you had a cute, uh, in your words. Yeah, a cute oh, yeah. A so uh, Oh, yeah, I did have a cute paramedic in the ambulance. It was wonderful. You know, I've known these paramedics for a long time, okay? I know them ever since the old days when I used to self-present as a female. And here's a funny little story. I was getting out of my uh, out of my shower. The way you see my house, the way it is now, it wasn't that thing where it used to be a bathtub where that shower was, mm-hmm. and there was like dry rot under the floor. So, mm-hmm. but I didn't know there was dry rot, and I got out of the uh, bathtub and fell down through the floor with one leg. Just went down through the house, through the floor, and I was okay. bigger than I was probably around eight hundred, and so. Um, it was like, and I thought, oh, wow, this is how Fatty Arbuckle died. And I went, oh, my God. I thought how he died Arbuckle on top died. of a, didn't he die with a hooker? No, 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 he fell through the ceiling. He fell oh. through the ceiling. And, yeah, no, he had his, uh, his career died because of a hooker. That's right. <laughs> Hooker's right. Yeah, but, yeah, but he actually physically died because he fell through uh, his attic and got caught in and his leg. I can imagine if you're up. if you're obese, the worst way to die would be to fall through your floor, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just gonna be a joke. It's gonna be a headline, everybody right. laughing. So but you're okay now. You're in the hospital, Tiger. they they fixed you up? Well, they fix me up at Cedars. You know, they spoil me, they treat me well, they understand, they love me here. And so yeah. So yeah, so yeah, they're fixing me up. It's like it'll take a couple of days for um them to, you know, get my heart back and, um, you know, lower the heart rate a little bit. You know, so some adjustments, some medication. Cause it's not a big deal, you know. See, the thing about it is I'm lucky because I have a really good team of physicians. And um, I just, the other day I woke up, I didn't feel right. And my and Walter, my cardiologist, said, well, we just want to put you on a heart monitor. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so he put me on a heart monitor. And... um and me, and then he goes, oh wow, you did an AFib for like a week. And so you got to go into the hospital. Oh my gosh! I was like, I don't want to go to the hospital. And he's like, I don't care. You got to go to the hospital. And so then I did. So you know, and here I am. Wow. But um, yeah. So anyway, when I fell through the floor, let me finish my story. Can okay, I finish yes. my story? Yes. Please. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So I fell through the floor, and um, I called. Uh, I have to actually call the fire department. Fire department comes. They're trying to get me out of the floor. I throw on a sundress, okay, because I'm just coming out of the shower, all right? And that's the only thing I can throw over me. Well, I can't put on any lingerie because one leg is trapped down in the floor. And so I'm flirting with the firemen and talking about their hoses and their <laughs> big tools and stuff like that, and they're being fun. So they go, well, you know what? We're going to have to go under the house to get you out. And so... This guy, they, so they go, and they're all like, we'll all go, we'll all go under the house. We all need to go. So they all go running under the house, and so then the guy comes back, and um, 
<laughs> and he goes, so, ma'am, we're going to have to go under the house to get you out. And so then he comes back and he goes, okay, sir, you should be able to remove your <laughs> Oh, they saw the goods, huh? <laughs> yeah, they saw the goods, yeah. It's just like that thing with the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they just imagine being a fireman. You get a call. Someone fell through the floor. You get there. It's a woman. You're feeling you're like, this is already crazy. It's a big woman through the floor. I'm going to go down and help. And then you see testicles. That's got to be one of the weirdest calls they've probably got. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Time. I bet they tell that story every night. <laughs> One time. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're you're doing better. I don't know what the uh, – is there anything anyone can do for you? Are you good? You don't need anything from our litany of listeners? Um, no, no, just some positive thoughts out there in the universe for me. You know, that's a good thing. I say with my your litany of listeners can do, listen to my show <laughs> tomorrow. Sweet. But, um, Are you going to yeah, do the show is, from, from the hospital tomorrow? Oh, yeah, I'm going to do the show from the hospital, of course, honey. You know, this, I'm like Mickey Mantle. You know, this is stuff that must go on. Look at you. You know, and so that's the thing. So, now what is this show about? There's some porn actress who is now an author. Yes, she quit porn. Uh, she hasn't called in yet. I do see I have another caller who is. I, I got to find out if she wants to. Hey, Jen, does yes. our caller want to talk? Because I know she's. Yes, she's willing, she wants to join in this conversation and also would love to talk to Jenny. Um, she wants to try to talk me into taking some pictures, too. So. Okay. Well, have a hold on because I wasn't sure. She's calling to talk. Okay. I, I'm seven months pregnant, Billy, so we'll see. <laughs> oh, there are people who like that. I know. That's what she's telling me. I want to see how much it pays. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough. Oh, honey. Jake, where do you find us? <laughs> I know. You know, I tried for a long time to find normies and uh, center myself You're around normal, after. healthy people, but it just doesn't work. I don't fit in. That's the problem. This is these, you guys are my crew. This is the kind of people. Yes. These are the normal conversations I have day to day. Well, Billy, I'm going to take this other call, but I appreciate you calling. I hope this is a sign that you'll call into my show anymore because you uh, a little bit more because I you know will. I love I'll you. call in. I promise you, I'll call in next week. And it's been nice talking to you guys. You and, too, feel better. Um, yeah, feel better, right. Billy. So if, I, if you guys hang up on me, can I still just listen to the show from yeah, my yeah. phone? Yeah, I want to hang okay. up on you. Yeah, okay, that's fine, because I want to listen to the show. Okay, cool. All right, talk to you okay. later. All right, Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, you too, bye. Um, so I see our next caller. Is a caller, uh, uh, Faith, are you there? I am here, Jake. This is so exciting. Hello. I know uh, I can say who you are. and all. I mean, I, I know the limitations and everything, but I can say you're Faith on Twitter. I already did, too late. You, I'm Faith on Twitter. Yes, I have an alias, which is Faith Fox, and gotcha. um, I've been in the porn industry slightly off of it. Like I never have done porno videos with strangers or anything like outside of my own home. <laughs> so it's a little bit different my view on things. You do. You, have, but, um, you actually have sex for the type of porn you do. Yeah, with myself and dildos yeah, no, she, and I'm vibrators yeah, you, and you, you do some guys basically. don't even want to see that. So, <laughs> for for those of us who know and the know uh, that are connoisseurs in pornography like myself, Faith is a what, what's referred to. Correct me if I'm wrong, Faith is a webcam girl. And yeah, I actually go, am known around the globe as the cam princess. Cam so princess. I kind of like made my own little name for myself, and I have you know. I've been I started doing webcam in 2003, but from 1999 to 2003, I ran a phone sex business because webcam that barely existed. Like Logitech was just coming out with their first like, you know, oh, say hi to your grandma while she's across the country and so gotcha. it evolved and I and, evolved with it. <laughs> and you have a camera and a computer and a guy would type like, you know, I want to see your butt and do this, can you do this and you you do that. <clears throat> yeah, actually, in when I first got started in 2003, there wasn't even streaming video. I mean, like, you could go on Yahoo and, and do it like that, but the first site that um, I met a lot of girls that are, you know, there's a handful of us that have been in the industry f for as long as, you know, we all know each other. We've all been there. And the site was, um, it's no longer in business. And, uh, and you have to be careful in this business on the internet because there's a lot of sites that come and go and when they go your money goes if you had six hundred dollars and you're waiting to be paid that that money's gone oh, and sure. one um example of that is e-passport i can't think of the name of the movie right now but um they had made a movie about the industry and when they released the movie it came out 
in a theater, and they shut it down right away. The government did. Was then that because Fred Willard was in the theater watching that? Is that why they shut it down? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, they, I, can, I can't think of the name of the movie right now for the life of me, but um, That's I funny. mean, it was in, it's in Redback, so you can Netflix it, and I'll figure out the name of it. But it's a good movie, but that company, when the government shut them down, all our money was frozen. Every girl, every company that had money wrapped up with them, um, gone. And that's what happened with this other website. On that one, it was like three seconds. Every three seconds, a photo would be taken if you were in a paid show. Yeah, so it was kind of like, and there was no audio either. It was like just, you know, every three seconds, a quick pose, you know, as long as yeah. however it was going. So it's like it's really been an interesting process over the years because now – uh, I could have a hundred guys in one show, all watching, streaming, throwing in their two cents or their dollars, you know, but their two cents is <laughs> do this, do that. So well, it's, ask, it's it's interesting. Let me ask you this, Faith. If it, um, we can talk about anything, yes? Pretty much. Okay. Um, Go for it. Well, I'm not sure if Jenny's going to call in, but the you know the porn industry. If she doesn't, then you can be our resident porn star. But <laughs> you have. <laughs> You have basically, and I'll be very careful, but I know that you have, you know, a real life. Obviously, you're you're married. Yeah, I have a real life. I have real life family, children. Um, I keep this life is like I, it's night and day. No, I try. I believe, anyways, that nobody in my community really knows. Or and the few people that do know, there's a few uh, police officers. I have one sheriff that lives to the left of me at my porn house. Um, and one that lives to the right. And they both know um, what's going on in here. They kind of, when I bought the house, um, they made it known that they weren't going to let me run a studio here. They weren't going to let me let girls come in and work off of my computers. You know, they made it very clear without really, you know, making a federal issue out of it, which Um, it's really not illegal. But no. it's such a great area. The the uh, especially now, LA's all under fire for everything, with you know wearing condoms. I guess even it, from what I told Bobby today, because Bobby, that's my husband. He did shows with me when he was feeling young and fresh, <laughs> and um, I said, well, we you know back in California, they say you even have to have a condom even if we're married, and you know, he's that's like, what? That's doing. crazy. But, but you want to ask you this? I, mean, um, I try and keep it on the down low. But you're so trying to help get you. move past it, yes, or or no? Oh, yeah, I am. I mean, I've been doing, like I said, 13 years, and I'm ready to move on, and do other things, and I do a lot of other stuff. Like, if I didn't have what I have right now with this job, I wouldn't be able to put any time or effort into my other ventures because I'd be working like a nine to five job and taking care of kids and, you know, who has time for all of that. But with this job, I, you know, I work 12, 15 hours a week. I barely, you know, when, with schools in session, I'm not even noticed that I'm missing or gone or anything, you know. Would you be so willing to, because um, I see Jenny's actually on the line. She called in, so I cool. really want to take my yeah, guess. Yeah, put me on hold. Uh, I'm going to put you on mute, or if you want, if, um, if Jenny's open to it, maybe we'll take calls at the end if you want to call back then. I mean, I'll put you on mute now so you okay. can listen, but you'll, for me to know that you want to talk, you have to hang up and call back. But I definitely that want to get fine. to Jenny. So thank you. I'm so glad you called. We'll have to do. We'll have, to have you call back, um, make you our guest. Thank you, Faith. Okay. That sounds good. I'm going to um, hang up, and then I'll call back in if I want to say something else so I can listen and you chat at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bye, so, Faith. Thanks for calling. Sorry. Mm-hmm. I'm so Bye-bye. excited to have uh, Jenny on the line. I wanted to get to it. So, Jenny, are you there? Yes, I am. How are you doing today, Jake? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for calling in. I'm very excited to talk to you. I was... Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Of course. You've got quite the PR blitz going on. Uh, yeah, just just right now. It, it turns out it to be a very different kind of PR bliss than when you're in the adult industry. I guess adult industry is more like constant, um, look at me, look at me, look at me. And this is like, it's been like a week, and now it's like already dying down. I'm like, yeah. okay, back, back to real life. It's really nice. So, I, I don't know how, if you heard the beginning of the show, but I gave a brief description in my own words about, you know, your, your past and where you are now. And uh, did you listen or were you not? No, I did not hear. I was actually um, on my Facebook, which I think is fairly standard for everyone in the world. Um, Fair enough. Well, what I said, if you want to just do it, you know, if you want to explain, you know, 
pen and flame and the whole thing real quick. That'd probably be best for you to do instead of me reading it off Wikipedia. I hate doing that. No, it, no, I get you. Um, Wikipedia. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you something real quick. <laughs> a really great day in my life was when writer came before ex porn star on Wikipedia. I was like, today is the day that I am. You know what I mean? Like it was a big deal. It's it's, uh, it's funny how that works. How Wikipedia is, has come to define, you know, who I am. Uh, it doesn't, which is which is actually very nice. Uh, and neither does pornography. I I used to be an adult uh, film star, porn star, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, I was in the business for uh, roughly eight years. Um, you know, worked in every in every cog of that wheel, so to speak. You know, um, from from the the soft stuff like uh, solo solo magazine layouts, and then you know I've, I've progressed as as any kind of um, thing progresses, whether it's right. using drugs or uh, alcohol, <laughs> seems to be a, a steady progression into like the harder things. And um, you know, in eight years past, and I found myself uh, without an identity that didn't involve pornography, and without um, healthy boundaries, and without um, without an idea of, of what I was going to do after, because I didn't think that there was going to be an after. And uh, you mean you thought you on porn forever, porn. or that you weren't going to well, live alone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I thought I thought it was going to be porn forever. I thought that once I had outgrown um, my my stripper heels and and you know belt size skirt, um, <laughs> that I would I would just go into the business side of it, and that that was just going to be my life, you know. Because I mean, and you see it across the the news and in the media all the time that you know, like porn star tries to move on with life and become teacher. Okay, it doesn't work. You know, porn star tries to move on with life and becomes whatever. This is, it's really hard um, for women to move on with their lives who've been in the industry and and to still be honest about about where they've been. And um, anyway, I I ended up doing a a rehab show with Dr. Drew. I ended up doing sex rehab in uh, April of 2009. Didn't air until later that year, but I did it as a joke, thinking that it would you know um, really help my porn career. Oh, so and you went on say. to the sex rehab. To to publicize your pornography. Uh huh. That's yeah. actually smart, I mean, uh, and I, that's actually a smart <laughs> idea. But anyway, go ahead. Right? No, I mean that's totally what I thought too. I thought this is genius. It is. Yeah. <laughs> like Andy you Kaufman know? genius. Yeah, totally. And I, you know, it's like, of course you're a sex addict. Like you're a porn star. You just work really hard, you know. And that's uh, that was the thinking. And of course, what ended up happening is that you take the drugs away, you take the sex away, you take the the booze away. You take the attention away. You take the, you take all of the shit away, and uh, what you're left with is yourself. And if, if you don't know, if you don't know what that is, then then you're in big trouble. <laughs> and that's that's what what I really want to talk about, if if you don't mind, is that moment because this show, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist. I always joke that I'm like a, a backseat psychiatrist. Um, I dropped out of college. I was taking psychology at the time. But those moments, something I talk a lot about here, it's probably the one theme I do have, um, mm. is about quieting distractions and dysfunction mm. and being honest where you come from and who you are because in those moments when it's quiet, which so many people are terrified of that moment, which is why they're doing these things, you have to face a lot of things. So it seems to me that you went into sex rehab, you know, you were going to do this <laughs> brilliant promotion for porno and something must have happened. When it got quiet, what is it? What happened? What did you see, or what did you feel that changed? Nothing, and that's what was so horrifying: is that everything got quiet, and there was absolutely nothing. There was there was no future, there was no identity, there were no people around me that that actually cared, or that I knew how to care about. Um, the one thing that I could see was just wreckage everywhere. I mean, it's like. You know, in Universal, when, when you're on the tram ride and, and you drive by that airplane and there's just crap everywhere, mm-hmm. so it was like that was that was my life. It was just crap everywhere, and then you know the bubble that I that I existed in. And um, mm-hmm. you know, in in that silence, in that moment, it just it became glaringly obvious that it that it was a problem that I didn't have an identity that was outside the adult business, and that um, you know I had come to sabotage this rehab process. Yeah, I mean. Dr. Drew, in that show, it, it, it's hard enough, you know, for um, people in the recovery world to be taken seriously if, if you appear on that show, you know, because the claim is that it's very salacious and that people are being, 
you know, um, exploited. But that's what I went there to do. I went there to exploit the show. And, uh, you know, it, it just it just didn't work. And, um, you know, when, when Dr. Drew kept calling me Jenny, refused to call me Penny and refused to play the game as, you know, after eight years of being called Penny, um, I, just, I just didn't know who I was, you know. And at 26, you, you hear of having a midlife crisis, even though, like, that's kind of been... It's more like a midlife reassessment, I think they call it, um, right. psychological terms. But, you know, at 26, to be going through that, like, oh, my God, I have nothing. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know if I have a future. I don't know how to care about people. I don't know how to connect with people. To have absolutely no coping tools to function in the world, it was horrifying. And, uh, and when Dr. Drew first, you know, he refused to call you Penny, and he mm-hmm. called you by your birth name, Jenny, mm-hmm. that and I, I think that's brilliant of him, by the way. The, I imagine that wasn't something that was easy to take. I, I imagine you probably got defensive early on. No, because I, I, I like to play it cool. I mean, that was the other thing is that, like, always play it cool, always play it cool. Nope, no, I mean, in, always in, okay. internally, not, I mean, maybe he thought you were playing it cool, but, I mean, that had to freak you out that he wouldn't. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, in, well, when I watched was, those, that was, that was one of my favorite seasons, and I – thought it was brilliant too but watching her she I mean you seemed like you regressed a lot like became very young and you know being a Jenny (laughs) you know I know that name sounds young in itself and I don't even go by it anymore because it makes me feel like my childhood and it wasn't a good childhood so I didn't know watching you go through that with your name I was like it is a big deal it's who you were called your whole life and now here's someone forcing you back to who you are yeah, it was it was horrifying, and, and um, what's interesting is that I I recently I did a head or I went on headline news with Drew, and uh, and I, I watched some of that footage, and I saw that, um, and it was it was a different a different woman, you know, certainly a different woman than I am today, and a different woman than went into pornography, and um, it it was just I I just I I looked at that footage and. I can't help but feel like, you know, like the person that is in that just looks like she is in shock, you know, like just absent in the eyes, uh, absent in like the tonality of my voice. I mean, there's just, it's all monotone. It's just up and down. It's, it's, it's totally missing. And, um, it yeah, I, mean, you? I, I just, I, well, I just, I feel, I mean, of course it was me. Um, you know, I, I think that that's a big problem with, with addiction is that, you know, a lot of people who, who suffer from addiction like to be able to separate themselves from their, their addicts, like they're, like they're separate people. Yes. But really, you know, it's, it's, it's me. You know, it's right. me. I have, I have addictive qualities. I'm suffering from the disease of addiction, and, and it's, it's all me, you know, and, and I need to keep it all together. But I look at that, and that is not the person that I see in the mirror today, and that's, I suppose, what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I talk about addiction a lot. Again, vaccine psychologist here. And <laughs> it's my... Th- Belief. I have a lot of problems with Dr. Drew, actually, with just the term, and Dr. Billy, who was on the phone earlier, gets mad at me, too. The very term disease, I know there is a definition that supports what he's saying, but I, I have a problem with it because the same thing you just said. When, In my opinion, by calling it a disease, you are then making it a separate thing from you. And everybody does act like, you know, especially 12-steppers, they get in this thing like, oh, it's my disease, it's not me, it's this other thing. And the reason you're addicted is because you're not happy with who you are, or whatever your life, wherever you came from. There's something you're trying to hide, and you can't cope with it. The way in which you cope with it is by tuning out. And that's why sex or drugs or alcohol or whatever it is, that becomes uh, you know, your crutch or vice, so to speak. But it yeah, sounds like you I mean, agree with me on that. Uh, no, because I, on a very physiological basis, um, addiction is 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 a part of your molecular structure. Right? There's not like a gene per se, but um, the way that alcohol affects an alcoholic is different uh, physiologically than the way an al- alcohol affects somebody else. And and there is a lot of um, of gross generalizi- generalizing um, in in twelve step recovery, and I I think that's you know because. People just need it to be easy. They don't want to complicate things. They don't want to overthink things because then it gives them an out to go and use right. again. And, um, you know, I think in that aspect, the the 12-step program is, is brilliant because it's, yeah. it's really about keeping it simple and um, I mean, not coming up with different reasons, you know, to go and use. Well, my body's different, so maybe I can, like, train myself to, to react differently. But, um, 
Well, I think it's a useful tool initially if you're talking about giving off something and and basing your life. But and I don't want to devolve this into a weird discussion. We'll stay on you. But the reason <laughs> alcohol affects an alcoholic differently is because they are. Um, let's just be real here. They're ingesting a lot more alcohol, and that your body will adjust physiologically no, to no, any sort of outside I, thing. I I black out after two cocktails. I right. mean, and there's plenty of people that can black out. Uh, after like 15 cocktails, and there's plenty of people who drink two cocktails and don't feel drunk, or who drink two cocktails and do feel drunk. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, my wife's my Indian. wife's Native American; she's Indian, so I mean, mm-hmm. yes, that that is yeah. true. But I, I'm talking um, about um, maybe more of a spiritual disease. I mean, here's the thing: I yeah. tell me if I'm wrong, because I do generalize a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. When I hear somebody's an adult film star or porn star, um, mm-hmm. my initial thought is always this is a person that has, you know, issues. This is a person that comes from probably a, a troubled background, and this was a life that needed to give them validation or attention. I mean, it never seems to me. I know a lot of adult film stars try and mainstream it or talk about how it's a good way of mo- making money and all this stuff. But what's fascinating to me about you is that I, I don't I don't hear you doing that. I'm not saying you're judging other adult film stars, but at least for you, it felt like it was not the right world. It's not a happy yeah, place. Yeah, I mean, it was. While I was doing it, I was having a great time. But to come out and say um, that that what you're doing is unhealthy, I mean, immediately you would have to change something. It's like right. it's like when people who are you know in active addiction or in you know drug use, and I, I just make this comparison because it's an easy go-to. Um, right. You know, like while they're doing it before they've realized it's a problem, they're having a great time, you know. But as soon as they realize there's a problem, it's either A, like stuff gets really, really bad. B, you have to make a change, whether it's, you know, 12-step, whether it's rehab, whether it's um, finding God. I mean, whatever whatever it is that helps you with, you know, that change, that's that. Or you die, you know, and that's it. And, um, and I think the adult industry is, is very much in the same in that, I, I am a firm believer that, you know, a lot of the women in there and, and a lot of the men, too, um, are very wounded. You know, there's on a very uh, basic psychological level, there's a lot of trauma that has made um, pornography a, a valid option, a valid career choice, um, you know, and, and that as long as they want to continue having a career, there's no way that they can even acknowledge that it might be harmful. Right. Um, I know that for me, that was the change in in rehab, was that once I started to look at the ways in which my behavior was self-destructive, like the promiscuous behavior, the, um, the alcohol and drug abuse, the... Um, just being totally emotionally unavailable to everyone, including myself. I mean, once I started to really acknowledge those issues, there was no way I could go back to being in pornography because I had way too many feelings. And, like, all of that had turned back on, and I was like, I'm not a good porn star with feelings. <laughs> what the, I mean, why did you get into porn? Did you come from, I mean, are you talking about yourself, or were you well, rare I mean, in that you came from a normal background? I didn't research purposely didn't research any of that stuff. I apologize if it's not fun no, to No, I like about. that. No, I know. It's, 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 it's what there is to talk about. I mean, you know, I uh, I, mean, I, I wasn't abused as a child. Um, both of my parents, you know, my mom's a, an alcoholic. My dad um, has dealt with some ad- addiction issues, um, whether or not, you know, he is, an alcoholic or an addict, that I, you know, that's that's what it is. Maybe one reason I say that about my mom is because she has said so. So it's like a that's some place I can go. Gotcha. Um, and uh, you know, when when my my parents divorced when I was, they started the divorce process when I was 13, and it was finalized by the time I was 14. And um, in that divorce, and in those years in my life. Um, including when I lost my virginity, I lost my virginity at 13, um, a lot of it was very traumatic in that um, my mom didn't have good coping skills, you know, and my dad didn't have good communication skills. Right. Um, and and what that uh, did for me was that as a child, 
I didn't feel, you know, well, not even as a child, but as a, as a young teen or, you know, late adolescence, I, I didn't feel safe. Um, I, I didn't learn how to um, process emotions that were uncomfortable. And I didn't um, find my self-worth in what's between my ears. You know, I, I went to what's easy and, and to what, you know, guaranteed. Which were is you sucks. doing it, I mean, in a sense for when you were being promiscuous, was it something you wanted the attention? You didn't feel so you were... were oh, yeah, there's a de- I mean, it's definitely attention-seeking behavior. Right. Um, I feel like some of it was probably crying out for help. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, of course, this is all hindsight. At the time, you know, I just thought that, you know, if people are going to say I'm slutty because I'm flirting, then I might as well follow through, you know. Right. Um, you, you just don't have that kind of, like, foresight when you're 13 and 14. No, of course not. You know? But, I mean, that's what parents are for. I mean, essentially, well, exactly. that's what they- did they? Were you able to? Talk, I mean, did you have a relationship with your parents that I mean at least could talk to them? I know you say they didn't have good coping skills, so I imagine they probably weren't the best parents, but they were around to talk to at least. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. You know, once once they divorced, I mean, the night that my mom left my dad was super traumatic. You know, she loaded us into the car and we left for a hotel, um, and and we stayed in that hotel for two weeks. And she told me that. My dad was looking for me, that he wanted to steal us away from her, you know, and which is scary stuff to hear oh, no matter what age you are. Um, Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and then I was looking after my brother and sister who were younger than me, so I took on that uh, motherly matriarch, you know, must take care of, of the younger siblings kind of attitude. And, um, he, yeah, and my mom was, she had her own stuff going on, you know, like, she had her own stuff going on, and I was too angry with my father um, to talk to him. I, I didn't talk to him from the time I was 14 to the time I was 26. Um, oh, at, all, at all? Well, I talked to him for like seven months um, when I was on this insane cocaine spree, um, and I needed a car and money, and that's when I called him, you know. But once once all of that ended, I cut him out of my life again. You know, I, it wasn't until my grandfather, his father, was on his deathbed and said, please start talking to your father again, that I was like, shit, you know, you have to you have to fulfill those kind of dying requests. Like, you can't just not do that. Um, so you're trying to rebuild those relationships now? Yeah, I'm 29 now. I have a, I have a good relationship with my father, which, um, you know, I, I've made amends to him. Um, because regardless of whether or not, um, whether or not, he fell short as a parent um, during that time. You know, there's a lot of things that I see, and I can I can say, yeah, I, I get that. You know, like, I don't agree with it, but I can't say that I would have done any better, you know. And and that being said, um, I, I did a lot of very cool things to him in my, in my youth, you know. Like, I would send back all his Christmas presents and his Christmas cards and his birthday presents. And I sent back every effort that he made to have a relationship with me. You know, and um, and now as as an adult, um, the fully functional frontal lobe, you know, it's like that's that's mean. It's mean and it's cruel, and that's not the way you treat somebody. And and it doesn't matter today what he did then. What matters is what we're doing now to maintain our relationship. And um, and it's definitely it's definitely better than what it was. You know, and I just got back from Africa. With him? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's working out there right now, which is crazy. But wow. uh, my sister and I went out to meet him and go on safari and do, like, really cool things. And, like, I got to show up and be present for that. And it was, you know, it was really special. So when you were in rehab and you're facing the quiet time and all this stuff is bubbling up, you mentioned earlier... I thought it was very telling that you said when you were 12 or 13, you didn't think you would ever get respect or attention for what was between your ears. You're obviously mm-hmm. very intelligent. You're, uh, you're, you know, you're an author. I, I encourage people to check your stuff out definitely after this. If you want to do this real quick, sorry to digress, but can you tell me the or tell our listeners where they can find your blogs and such? Oh yeah, uh, you can find my blog at becomingjenny.com and 
it's J E N and I E. I I think they're all directed to go there anyway, so it's right. not really big deal. Um and uh I just published a book about a week and a half ago called I Am Jenny, uh which kind of goes over everything that we're talking about here, if you want it in written form. It's it's, it's uh, a show is not enough. <laughs> I've read excerpts. I, I'm going to get the book. I'm definitely going to get the book. I, I urge everyone else to get it. Um, so, with that said, obviously, you're you're quitting the adult business, which you know you're. What were you? 28 when you started doing that? 27? I'm trying to figure that out. 26. Line. You mean 20, when she quit? Yeah, fine. That was just last year when you were in rehab. No, no 20, I, I thought three years, fine, three years, three years ago or so. I'm sorry. I don't yeah. watch. I hate Dr. Drew. So I don't watch his show. <laughs> I <laughs> love Dr. Drew. Three years Me ago. Too. Okay, so Jay three... Jay could use some Dr. Drew therapy, just so you know. <laughs> for sure. We'll get him in other therapy first so we can kind of ease him into it. <laughs> oh, I've been in therapy. <laughs> I have no shortage of going. But anyway, so, okay, so there's this point where, I mean, th- this is the thing why it's so hard for for uh, adult film actresses to break into other mainstream jobs. So, first of all, o- the obvious is that not a lot of people are going to have respect for you in another job. They're not going to take you serious, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. The other thing is you're in this world. Um, this is not a job like the rest of us go to. There's no nine to five in, in the porn industry. It's a full time gig, mm-hmm. and it's it's a world. It's not a job. It's a world, and mm-hmm. I think probably one of the hardest things to go mainstream, aside from the outside way you're viewed, is that it's got to be terrifying to sit there and go, okay, what do I do now? Uh, you know, it, you you have to literally drop not just your job but every contact you have every inroad you've built uh at, tw- at 26 years old and rebuild from those ashes that's got to be terrifying i mean you put so much time into it um it's very hard at that point to say okay well now i'm going to try this job you're even if you don't mention who you are even if you hide it you're, you don't have the discernible skills i imagine to go get you know a temp job or whatnot um so i imagine you're in this moment you're starting to think i can't go back i'm, I'm self-actualizing i'm realizing this this destructive path I'm on, what am I going to do now? Was your first thought to write at that moment? Oh, God, no. My my first thought was, like, to sell my underwear. I mean, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> That's what I, I mean, was thinking. That, yeah, you know, like, there's, there's, I was horrified. And, um, you know, I, it has really, that was the biggest thing, is, is that financially I had become so dependent on on the world and and you know you very eloquently said that it's it's not a job it's a world yeah. and um in in order to leave that world you really have to burn every single part of it down I mean I and that's a big reason why I started my blog is that I I knew that um and I and I think maybe it's it's, it's more like a subconscious knowledge um but I, I knew that if I put it out into the universe that I that I was leaving that I was trying to become a person. But I was trying to um, explore my feelings and sobriety and um, a real job and a real, you know, life. You know, if I put that out into the into the real world where porn people w- could see it, where uh, porn viewers could see it, then I'd, I'd be much less likely to go back to the industry because I, I mean, my ego is huge. You know, like I couldn't put my tail between my legs and be like, oh, okay, well, it's just, you know, it's all a joke. I'm yeah. back, you know. Um, it, it, that just isn't how it could work for me, you know. So one by one, um, I, I gave up every single thing in my life that made me a, a porn star. Um, from small things like uh, the way I interacted with men changed, and the way I interacted with women changed a lot because I didn't have girlfriends. So that was that's probably been a huge change, one of the biggest changes in my life, is that now I look in my text messages and it's all chicks. They're like homegirls. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not, they're all my friends, and uh, it's, it's really nice. Um, well, so just give them a few years. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the way I interacted with, with, with people in general changed. The the things I wore changed. The way I interacted with myself changed. Like, um I allowed myself to cry and hum pillows when I when I felt like, you know, jumping off a building. Um, because I was still too uncomfortable to be close to people and to trust myself to hug them without trying to do more. Um, I gave up uh the three bedroom house in the valley. I gave up the Mercedes Benz to start riding the bus. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I got I have a ten dollar an hour paying gig right now. Um, I'm back in school full time. I mean, there are certain steps, and it it wasn't all at once because that would have been really really traumatic as well. It was like a step by step um, process of letting go of the things that I thought I needed to be a person, you know, and uh, which has been the most freeing thing that I've ever done in my entire life is letting go of all of this. Shit. I mean, you're literally the phoenix. I mean, you're a phoenix. You're rebuilding. It's. It, I couldn't imagine that. I mean, that just got to take. What such, are you doing? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna kiss your ass for a second. That's got to take a huge <laughs> amount of, of courage. I mean, honestly, let's just take a second and think about. It. I mean, there are people I know, and I'm the same way. It's like, oh, I don't like my job because. Uh, so this person annoys me a little bit, but I'm too afraid to to move on. I mean, I'm not talking about my job because my mom will fire me. Uh, I'll give you another <laughs> example. Whatever it is, there are certain things where people do feel trapped in their lives, and the sacrifices they would have to make don't compare to where you come from or a lot of other people. It just sort of puts those things in perspective. I know a lot of people feel trapped and lost, uh, but none of them have to literally start from scratch. None of them have to walk away from a well-paying job. Um yeah. To you know, riding the bus that you say those are those are the kind of things that nobody would do. You know, so many people you know, want to be comfortable, even when they're not. They'd rather be a little bit mildly uncomfortable than than face an unknown fear, which is just human nature. So, I, again, I applaud you for that. For what it's I, I, you know, I, I wish that I could take uh, credit for that, but the truth of the matter is that I couldn't have done any of it without the support system that that was built up around me. I mean, and that's, and that's one of the things that I, you know, I know you don't like Drew, but, like, Drew really helped me um, build the support that I needed to to make these changes, you know. Like, like I continued seeing uh, Jill Vermeer, who was the therapist. I, I saw her for two years for free before she and I started discussing me making payments to her. And as it stands now, I only pay her 20 bucks a session because, Financially, that's what I can afford. You right. know what I mean? And so it's more the the I'm a woman of grace and integrity who pays for services instead of like here's you know what you're worth because I could never pay her what she is worth um, ever because she's she's invaluable and she's she's just priceless as a, as a human being and as a therapist. Um, and Dr. Drew put that in place, and uh, and the same with uh, Dr. Reef who was uh, you know at first. Um, advising me as a psychiatrist, and now we've we've uh, kind of reformatted our relationship and and uh, renamed our relationship um, into a, into a mentorship. And so he's he's now mentoring me, and we're starting to do research together. And um, you know, between between that, between being introduced to twelve step, between uh, Dr. Drew, who has literally been by my side through everything. I text I text him at all my landmarks. You know, um, and every every big thing that you know comes into my life is a direct result of the the, the small door that he helped open um, to myself. And uh, I I have been blessed and fortunate enough to have the willingness to take their suggestions. But as it stands, like I didn't do any of this. I just followed direction and did what was advised and what was suggested that I do. And um, I've had faith. Uh, that the people that are advising and suggesting uh, know what they're talking about and um, and have my best interest at heart because I don't make good decisions. You know, um, I obviously <laughs> eight years later in porn, I'm like, oh, this is great. Like, this is totally going to work forever. Right. Um, I, I don't make I don't make good decisions on my own. So I, I wish that I could um, take uh, all of that. Well, you phrase. are doing. I mean, that's wonderful to hear, but I mean, you are doing the the ugly work. I mean, you are doing the ugly work, which is, that's the thing most people fear, and that's yeah. the thing that most people hide from. That's what those are the people will continue yeah. to drink or smoke or, or do whatever they got to do because they don't want to even feel the level of discomfort for a second that you're, yeah. that you went through. So that, that's not, I mean, that's not doing nothing. That's yeah. huge. That's more than most people do. So, you know, and I still hate Dr. Drew. Jake, Jake can't take any directions. Uh, no, I like Dr. Drew. Here's my problem with Dr. Drew. Again, it's what I said I earlier. Although Dr. Drew. It's changing we all love because, Dr. Drew. Well, you love him because you want to sleep with him, Jen. Well, I, I like he's a total very silver hot. fox. He That's is a one silver of the, fox. Yeah. See? Total silver okay. fox. That's one of the first things that I said to him on one of the first rehab days. Uh, he was, you know, giving out the rules and, like, things that we're not going to do and, like, we're not supposed <laughs> to sexualize. 
And I'm like, well, what if I've already undressed you both with my eyes? And he's like, well, that's actually a thing, and we're not doing that here. And I was like, son of a bitch. What am I going to yep. do? And then he's such anyway. a good man on top of it. He's such oh, a good husband. God. You can let's, tell. let's change it. So this is let's business. talk about Dr. Drew. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, again, it's maybe my opinion's changing because you, you said all the right things to me. Uh, the other things I followed in his career, uh, the people and himself, is that he, again, my opinion is that he separates the dysfunction and the disease, quote unquote, from the person. Maybe I'm, I stand to be corrected if that's not the case, but that's what I see, and it, that's a huge pet peeve for me. Uh, yeah, that's all. I, I think- I, no, I, no, it's okay. I mean, I, I think that's more of more of a, a psychological definition that he is kind of regurgitating, and less of a him, you know, justifying or or green lighting the separation of addict and person. Um, I, I think what that uh, really is about is that the things that I do in active addiction um, are not things that I am okay with doing when I'm not using um, fill in the blank. And I think I think that's you know I think that a lot of people have a difficult time comprehending that you know if you just add water to this little like you know styrofoam pill it'll turn into a dinosaur you know I think a lot of people want to think that the dinosaur and the pill are different things um, right you know but 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 I'm, not, I'm I am an addict and I suffer from the disease of addiction which is part of my biological physiological makeup, and that's just how it is. Um, we're gonna have to, I'm going to have to have a call back from the show because that, that there is, that's my pet peeve. Here's what I think. I mm. think you you are a girl who... Totally. Well, yeah, I know that much. <laughs> At 12 or 13, your parents separated. Your, your relationship mm-hmm. with your parents was, was strung out. You admitted this. You then mm-hmm. needed validation. You needed attention mm-hmm. from elsewhere. You also had anger. You were all those kinds of things. I don't think that's my point is I don't think that's biological. I think that's environmental. Um, maybe you know, like I said, my wife's Native American. She can't drink as much. There are certain things, of course, but it was that absence, that void that you had, that led you to become addicted. Totally, I think if you, totally. that's that's the point I'm trying to make. So I, when I, totally when I hear it's biological that. or it's my brain's an addictive thing, it's like no, no, no. You're you. There may be some um, physiological thing, but the truth is, it's the pain in your life from the relationships that you had in your formative years or whatnot that are leading you to this. And maybe Dr. Drew, uh, you know, off camera says that. Maybe I shouldn't judge a guy off a reality show. I should know better than that, being a star (laughs) of one myself. Um, (laughs) But, uh, you know, that's what I see him say. He'll constantly say, that's not you talking, that's your addiction. It's like it's a monster over your brain or it's a physiological thing. It's your brain chemistry. And it's like, no, no, it's because she's upset with her father. That's why. And but he does go into those issues. That's yeah, thing. he, he does. does treat okay. all those deep underlying issues. But yeah, okay. he does call it. Well, a then I stand lot. corrected. Plus, I'd love to get him on my show, and he, and he doesn't respond to me on Twitter. That's the other reason. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to. I want to move on. I want to, you know, move on to the next thing. I, I have to say, as a as a someone who watches porn, Jenny, I do. Mm-hmm. I admit it. That's fine. That's uh, fine. This is a question I've always wanted to ask someone on the other end of the camera. When mm-hmm. I watch porn. I'll start with, like, you know, a standard video. There's mm-hmm. there's a good-looking woman. It's a standard act. Uh, yeah. I watch it. I do the deed. I move on, right? Yeah. Then yeah. a few hours pass. This is, by, by the way, when my wife's out of town. A few hours yeah. pass. I go back to that video. It's like chewing gum. It's lost its flavor. Uh, I don't know that I just want to see, you know, missionary. And yeah. then it goes into different positions. Fast forward, you know, eight hours when I'm in a masturbation thon. And I haven't drank or eaten. The stuff I'm watching is disturbing. I don't even like it. But it just needed to always one up the last video. It just the old things wouldn't oh! work. Yeah, and that was, you know what I just heard was you um, admitting your powerlessness over your sex addiction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have no. <laughs> that is exactly what I. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this exact share. Well, I think in, this is, uh, this is a show. <laughs> sorry to cut you off. This is a show we're going to do soon. Also, yeah. uh, I find that the more disgusting, well, I don't want to say disgusting, but the, the more uh, vivid pornography that exists, the quicker time it is for me to make, you know, to do the deed, to get to completion. Yeah. I find that has overflow. When yeah. the wife comes back, it's embarrassing. We're talking, you know, 30, 40 seconds, and then, the, of course, the uh, obligatory apology. Now, when she's gone yeah. and I don't look at porn, when she comes back, I'm, you know, the greatest lover of all time. Uh, that might be a yeah. little exaggeration, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> That's not me doing something. So 
<laughs> I wonder if you're – and I also – I know I'm dancing around, but let me get to the point. I watched the Cat House show, and I saw a lot of those women. Um, you know, They're actually prostitutes. It's a little different, but they were sitting there not saying, that, you know, you're not around. That different. It's not that different. But they're around sex, and I watch these women, even off camera, when they're off duty, they're having sex with each other. Yeah. And I want to ask you, when you start getting into this, when it is a world, like we've already said, you're in this full time, mm-hmm. it, it has to make you, quote unquote, as you said, a sex addict. Mm-hmm. Because that's you're living and breathing and eating and drinking sex all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 think, I, think you, I think you've brought up a lot of really interesting points, first of all. Um, that's one what I do. being, and I love that in a person and a man, especially. Cool, you can follow um, me and listen to my show. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Awesome. Um, I think it's, I think it's really interesting and really uh, a sign of the times that uh, we we need more stimulation than we used to, and whether it's in responding to massive amounts of emails every day or that ooh feeling when you know when you get out of a meeting um, like a business meeting and you realize that you have a bunch of texts um, and you're like oh my god I'm popular people like me they've been right. thinking about me you know. That kind of thing. I think that's very similar, and that uh, um, you know that that it takes more and more and more. Now, now whether or not that um, you know transforms into sex addiction is is particular to the person, I believe, um, because it, it doesn't really sound like it has for you. I mean, you sound like you're you're fairly cognizant of the behavior, and that you know you can put your penis down if you want to. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> well, that's like you know is. you know like my my wife. I love my wife. And when she's here, I'm like this total, normal, well-adjusted person. But when she's a flight attendant, so she leaves for 24 to 48 hours a ton- at a time. Yeah. Yeah. And the first, like, six hours, you know, it's like risky business. I'm running around the house in my underwear, like, woo, freedom. And and yeah. then that time, like you're talking about when you're in rehab, <laughs> that quiet time, there's not a lot to do. I can only play so many video games. I can only talk to my friends so much. That you know, so I find that porno is more of just a way to pass time. It's not that I need sexual stimulation. My wife's here. You know, there are other ways to pass time, Jake. What's that? Totally. There are other ways totally. to pass yeah. time besides watching porn and giving yourself <laughs> pleasure. We're talking eight hours, and you know, I read too. Eight hours. See, I think you do need Doctor Drew. No, no, yeah. I mean eight hours, and not into the masturbation. Eight hours into being alone, I'm saying that's when that's when the laptop comes out. Yeah, but you also said that's a marathon, too. Well, no, it starts there. You might want to check out a meeting or two. You know what you can do (laughs) is um, check out, uh, go to yoga classes. Start doing yoga, get into meditation, maybe some Tai Chi. I do uh, martial arts, Jenny. I do. It helps. Too much testosterone there. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah, you know, I I don't know if if being in the industry turns someone, I don't know, you know, it's very chicken or egg. You know, what comes first? What uh, what makes it okay that somebody goes into the industry in the first place? I mean, in what in what healthy world uh, is selling sex an option? You know, and and I'm not, um, and I think a lot of people probably have an issue with this, especially people that are anti pornography. I'm not anti pornography. Um, I am against selling sex just because I I'm a firm believer that um, that financial transaction changes the dynamic of of what you're exchanging. Um, and that that carries over into the rest of your life, I believe. Um, I understand that. You know, but I, I feel like if everything was a tube site, if everything was like a homemade video that was uploaded for like fun, then I feel like I feel like the world would be a better place, and and the world of pornography would be a, a much healthier place. Um, but you know, I, I don't know whether um, I don't know I don't know what came first, the, the being a sex addict or being a porn person, and I don't know. One necessarily leads to the other. Um, but I mean, being in a hyper-sexual environment would stimulate you. So actually, I think it'd be crazy to say not. I mean, it's not even a f- yeah. comes first. I didn't mean to put it that way. I just mean, do you think it puts it into overdrive? You know, you have sexual addiction and then you're doing porn all the time, and then it's just like you know, Charlie Sheen on. You know, there's some people that snort coke, and then there's Charlie Sheen in the same day. You know what I mean? Totally. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, I think that some people have intimacy issues, which is fundamentally what, what sex addiction is. It's, it's yeah. a difficulty relating to people on an intimate basis, and I think that some people have uh, some really deep-rooted intimacy issues, and that uh, for some people that manifests as um, sex addiction. And you know, uh, for some people, they end up in the in the porn business because they can't connect to themselves, and they figure, whatever, like I might as well make money. Um, you know, uh, prostituting myself in front of the camera. 
and that's fine. Um, you know, and then for some people, it manifests, you know, with a bottle and a way to disconnect from humanity there. And some people, I see it all the time at my restaurant, they manifest in their iPhone, and they yeah. get through the entire dinner, and they sit there and they text, and they don't talk to the person that they're with, and then they'll get up, kiss each other, and walk out. Like, that's not a big deal. And it's like, what is going on? Um, why, do, why can't we connect to anybody? Um, why, you know? That's, I mean, let's, that's where I was trying to go with my masturbation marathon story. That, I, I did a show uh, about this, actually. I was talking about addiction, you know, because a lot of people want to claim that addiction is something that happens to other people. Meanwhile, they're on Twitter, myself included, yeah. you know, eight hours a day, uh, or Facebook. Oh, yeah. um, but it's the same thing. It's this stuff. This is how I define it. It's needing an outside stimulation to feel some sort of void, ultimately mm-hmm. ignoring that it does not. Mm-hmm. And you're at that point instead of realizing, I need to get this somewhere else, I need a, a healthier avenue, you have mm-hmm. a choice, you're in the fork. The people that choose to do that, they're okay. The other people go, I need to get more friends or more followers, I need to get, the, then mm-hmm. they go the other way and they they chase the dragon, so to speak. And that yeah. used to be a small amount of people. Now, it's hard to find people that don't have addictions of some kind. Yeah. And yeah. what do you think I mean, that is? Really I mean, bad. you know, do you think it's just because you know, times are tough. No, technology is a big one. I think technology has made it available to everybody yeah, from porn absolutely. to getting your drugs online even, but to yeah. getting um, the iPhone. Even with my kids, yeah. they said something that horrified me just a few weeks <laughs> ago. Like, you love your iPhone, Mommy. <laughs> like, they said it like it was a passion, and, like, they want, they didn't want to drop it is what it was. Like, oh, sorry, well, you know, because you love your iPhone. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, if they're noticing that. So I consciously put it away when I'm around them. Uh, you know, I might walk yeah. past it and check something on my way out. But I do not like to hold it while I'm at the table with them or playing with them because they are seeing that I'm connecting with a thing and not them. Such a strange yeah. time. It's so I mean, it, but you know, it makes sense. I mean, what what that stimulates um, in our brain is uh, is the neurotransmitter oxytocin, which is the same neurotransmitter that that goes crazy when we have an orgasm. And you know, what it's actually doing is stimulating our reward centers, our nucleus accumbens. I think is the it's like a little button that's up in your brain, and it just gets pushed and pushed and pushed. And the more you push it, the more times you need to push it. And um, any, any a wide variety of things can push it. Orgasms push it. Emails. When you get emails, they push it. Text push it. Angry birds pushes it. I mean, a lot of things. You know, <laughs> that, that eating pushes it. Taking a giant poop pushes it. You know, yep. you come out of the bathroom and you're like, yes, awesome. You know, like. I know I, those are the people that are getting barium animals like four times a week. <laughs> right. Um, and and uh, <laughs> we, it's it's true though. You know, it's um. Yeah. It is really disconcerting, but it's just it's just where we are today, and it's you know it's um, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, it's like like with sugar and like with berries. Like we are people who like berries because we couldn't get berries that much. When, you know, like when we were like learning how to walk on all fours, and when that whole process was happening, or on a, I'm sorry, on two feet. Um, you know, like it was it was hard to find sweets, and so now. Um, that there's sweets everywhere, there's this huge obesity problem, you know, and it's because we don't know when to turn it off and we don't know how to turn it off. And and um, to a certain extent, we've been told that turning it off isn't really necessary. Right. And that's, I mean, okay, we're spiraling. I don't, I don't want to close it down, but I will say <laughs> one of the things I've, you got to call back, one of the things I've noticed, you know, I'm a, I'm a capitalist, I love America, but when, I don't get too yeah. political often, but it seems like there's more of an abundance now of sayings like greed is good or you should be able to get what you want without regulation and there shouldn't be someone telling you what you can and can't do. Well, no surprise to me that when that started, you know, everyone got fatter and more drug addicted. Uh, I look at old films or read old books and there used to be more um, talk about your word and your handshake and who you are. And yeah. that was never about your that. Honor. In fact, yeah, you were honorable if you... You know, and when somebody did make it and they were wealthy back in the day, they were considered honorable if they gave their money away, not if they Absolutely. kept it. And it's just, it's been this. We- I don't. Again, I don't want to get too political or anything, but I'll tell you, America now, it's all about what I can get. More, more, more. Me, me, me. It's all in my hands. And mm-hmm. anyone that tries to tell me to stop, uh, you know, is a 
is a commie socialist or something, and Mm -hmm. now everyone's 900 pounds, everyone's on medication of some sort, Mm -hmm. everyone's depressed, everyone's on eight-hour whack-a-thons like myself on the computer or Twitter. (laughs) And it's not hard. everyone, Jake. And not everyone. Come on, guys. Call, call in. And don't make me look like a freak here. I'm, I'm probably normal, but it's only eight hours. No, but how do we fix it all? I, I'm so. It makes me feel, um, you know, like biblical times. We need a good flood or something to wash this all away. We, how do you reverse all this? How, or, you know, just like with the Aurora, Colorado incident. How do you? These things didn't happen when we were, even when we were kids. You know, I'm a little bit older than Jenny. Um, a little bit older than Jake, and these things didn't happen. I think it's why we're so overprotective with our children, some of us mothers, but it just has changed dramatically and drastically over the last, you know, 20 years. It's There's something really sick about our country right now, and I don't can't put my finger on how to fix it. Well, let me just, we're, we're coming to the end, but I will say, um, to answer that, listen to Listen to me. First of all, tell your friends to listen to the show because I'm going to save the world. Jake will save the world, everybody. I mean, that's what we talk about. Every week we talk about this, and everyone's like, oh, why aren't you talking about Kim Kardashian's butt? You're so uh, such a downer. I want to shoot this. I don't want to go roar on these. But I'll say this. When when Jenny uh, Ketchum, not you, Jen, uh, was talking about that moment, uh, you know, and, and she fully admits when she went into rehab that it was a publicity stunt, but everything was taken away. The iPhone was down. Uh, the cameras were off, and there was that silence. That's where the battle is won for every single person. And not, I'm not just saying go quiet and do six hours of quiet because that doesn't work. You have to be quiet, and when the demons arise, when there's something you don't want to face, when you get that feeling of fear, something you're thinking about, when it comes up, go for it. Go through it. Push through it. Take it all the way. That's what I tell people all the time. You call it meditation whenever you want. Ask yourself, why am I doing this? What drives me? Why do I care so much that this happens? And and ask yourself. Go way back. Don't be afraid of it because what's happening is now everybody is not only afraid of that darkness in that moment, but now they're being sold happy pills that say you don't even have to worry. Just take this and your depression will go away. Here's an antidepressant pill that will just cut the – you don't even have to worry that your, you know, your father was an asshole. Just take this pill – and this is coming from doctors and people we we trust, and it's like, okay, well, you know, what's there's obviously nothing good about thinking about it because I just have a biological brain problem, and that's what's happening. So everybody, you got homework tonight. Uh, allow it to be quiet. Being alone and quiet is a good thing. And if something starts to scare you, if you're thinking about something, uh, even if it's horrible or traumatic, don't shy from it. Don't run from it. Your body will want to. Your brain will want to. All your defenses will come up. Continue to ask yourself questions. Don't be afraid of what you might find. And I guarantee you, when you come to the other side, uh, you'll be a better person. Um, I think it's why I keep getting alive. pregnant. <laughs> I keep getting yeah. pregnant because I, like, I have no choice. Well, I do have a choice, but, you know, I'm not that kind of mom. <laughs> but I have no choice but to be sober and to focus on what's about to happen. And I, it's one of my favorite times. Is it, It's the hardest time, but it's you have to focus on what's real and no phones um, in the labor room, but, but no yeah. drinking, no anything. I can't do anything, and it's a struggle sometimes, like camping. You're an you know, I am. I definitely am, and you know, I've been, I've been to rehab, Jenny. <laughs> We've got more than names in common. <laughs> well, Jenny, but, yeah. I want to hear what you have to say to my awesomeness there. I, I awesome. think it's, I think it's really good advice, and I think it's something that people have been trying to do. Um, for centuries, I, you know, I think feelings are really difficult to process, especially when, you know, like you said, we're we're being told, you know, you don't have to deal with the darkness, and and to take that further, you know, there's there's the thought that the darkness doesn't even exist, you know, and that, that you just not only don't have to deal with it, but that you don't have to acknowledge it, experience it, see it, think about it at all. Um, and you, like I I think one of the best things about uh, rehab and and the therapy has been. I've learned that my feelings aren't facts and that if I can just sit with them, um, not only do I come out um, a better person, I come out alive. And, that's, and that, is, that was a big fear of mine, is that if I sat with those feelings, that I would probably die. And, right. um, you know, and, and whether it's a physical or a metaphysical or spiritual, whatever kind of death I was afraid of experiencing, I was afraid that if I sat with my feelings, I would die. And what I find today is that not only... Um, are those feelings okay, but they, they trace to something. And once I can identify what I'm feeling, once I can see 
where it's coming from. I can I can really change my behavior in the now so that I don't have to keep feeling like that. I mean, I, I think that's the problem is that the longer you put it off, the longer you don't want to look at stuff, the longer you numb yourself to whatever it is that's inside of you that's causing you this this pain, the more difficult it's going to be to deal with when it when it all does bubble over. Because it will. It will bubble over. Um, you know, it, it, uh, Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman, is, you know, he wrote this brilliant book um, about the way that we think. Um, it's called Thinking Fast and Slow. I mean, it's what I'm reading right now. I'm just, like, so into it. Um, but he wrote about regressing to the mean and about how, you know, like, really, like, if you, if you're really too up or you're really too down, and, and either way, you're going to go back to being just level and normal. And, and he wasn't writing about it in um, regard to what we're discussing, but it's totally applicable. And um, if if you can, take this, this advice from Jake world um, and just let yourself sit through the feelings. And if you need to cry, then cry. If you need to hug something and nobody's there, um, hug a pillow. If you need to, you know, yell, then yell. If you need to just sit, then just sit. And, um, you know, and, and you'll sleep just fine. You'll wake up and you'll like yourself too. You will. You'll, you'll feel the weight. I mean, I've done it. I, I've, made, yeah. I've done it. And, I, you know, I've got a lot more to do. Trust me, I'm mm-hmm. a real uh, prick lately. I've been thinking about myself. I think I, it's time for your intervention, Jake. Well, I don't need an intervention. And I I'm need, talking about the doctor I need some quiet style. time. Yeah, when I get off this totally. phone, I'm, you know what, honestly, when I get off this phone, I'm going to jerk off. Then after that, Ew. I'm going to just take, no, I'm just kidding. I, when I get off the phone, I'm wow, going to take a, a couple hours because uh, I've, been, I've been having this feeling the last week. I'll give you an example, a real world example. I went out to dinner with my friend this week and I was talking and I just, was objective enough for a second. I don't know what it was. And I just heard myself talking. And I thought, what a prick. Yeah, who is this guy? Yeah, who is this yeah. guy? Exactly. Um, yeah. And I don't like it. I do it a lot of times, sometimes even on the show. Uh, I have these moments where I definitely uh, I know that I'm angry at something. I know mm-hmm. something's bothering me. I know people are starting to get on my nerves. Before it was a cute little thing I could joke. Now I'm starting to get a little bit uh, angrier than normal. And uh, it's something. It's, uh, it's coming to a head, and I'll tell you this: most people, I believe, that are feeling like me, will go, "Oh, it'll, you know, it'll pass." I, I know that it, it won't if I don't deal with it. And the last piece of advice yeah. I give you is these moments. You know, you sit there and you think, I hear this a lot from people. Ah, I'm over it now. Uh, I've already dealt with that, or you know, that doesn't define me. And meanwhile, you can see this monster underneath them just shaking through their skin, and it's like this crocodile that's caged in their cellar. And you, the best piece of advice I ever got from somebody was, if you don't deal with it, if you don't deal with those feelings in your past, you can ignore it only so long, because after a while, they will deal with you. Yeah. They will start to come out and deal with you. So you all got a lot of homework, myself included. <laughs> uh, Jenny, I, you know, what a blast. This is uh, probably my favorite show, honestly, my favorite interview so far. Um, she's awesome. And to everyone out there, too, read her blogs and buy her book. But her blogs are beautiful and well-written, and that's what I – I like the show. That's how I saw her first. But reading her tweets, um, which had connections, to her links to her blogs were amazing, and I loved reading them. So I'm getting her book. I am Jenny. I am, oh, too. You guys I'm, are great. I'm definitely going to – and I fully give you permission, Jenny, to write a blog about me and, oh. and your time on the show. You, uh, attention, attention, attention. If, as you, long if as you want you, to as interview me. you tag Dr. Drew in it so that um, he gives him some attention because he needs I'm going it. To. Yeah, I'll I'll think we I, have a, I think we should have an intervention about Dr. Drew. We don't need an intervention with Dr. Drew. We need to have an intervention for you about Dr. Drew. About I think that's yeah. – I would – okay. I think the real reason is he knows Dr. Drew would figure him out. <laughs> No, well, he knows true. that Dr. Drew would tell him that, that angry Jake is actually addict Jake, and uh, <laughs> you don't have to be that. Well, so what will yes. happen is Dr. Drew will meet me, and he'll go, you know what? Uh, you can learn from anybody. Uh, I was too caught up in academia and my own little bubble, and yet, right. Jake, you've come along and, and spurned this new creative vision. I can actually help people now. That's what <laughs> I met Dr. Drew. I met him. I shot a documentary. Totally. I met him a month and a half ago. I was in his office at Headline News shooting him an interview for Facebook about narcissism. (laughs) How ironic. (laughs) I know. Well, it wasn't me. But he talked and he admitted at that moment that he was a narcissist. He was very polite to me. And I have to admit that uh, he's a little bit of a silver fox. He is a little bit charming. I give it to him. Right. 
Uh, I would totally whip his ass in a debate. That's all I got to say. And in a medical, spiritual, therapeutic debate, I would whip his ass. That's okay, I thought you were going to say that you would whip his ass at like Madden. Well, that or, too. Like, I mean, I'm I'm like birds, super birds. awesomely, you know, martial artist and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and you play video now, games. Now, now go nap with your little thing. kitties. I know. I really want a cat. I got to go nap with my cats. Um, Jenny, uh, again, uh, God bless you. Uh, seriously, oh, keep up you. the good work. I know you know it's you're you're not done. You know that. Um, yeah. If there's God. anything, I'm gonna I'm gonna start Thank playing God. my music. But do you have anything God. you want to say to if there is 13, 14 year old? I doubt it, but it's probably illegal. Uh, or their parents won't let them. But if there are 13, 14 year old girls or boys listening now that are that are sort of teetering on going in that fork, is there anything you have? Any advice you have for them? Um. You're young, and your life is, uh, you don't want to hear this, but it's its going to be okay. Just don't do not be afraid to reach out to somebody and talk to uh, whoever it is that you trust about what you're feeling, and, and it's going to pass, and it's going to be okay. And then uh, thank you thank you all for having me on, and it's, it's been a lot of fun, actually. A lot well, of thank fun. Thank you, Jenny. I hope we can have you on again sometime. Yeah, and good luck with that girl that was on right before me. Yeesh. <laughs> yeah. She's she's a I love that woman. I'm gonna have her call back next week. She's sweet, Very but she's still that. trying to get me in a bikini for um money. That's not porn, is it? <laughs> it's yeah. not porn anyone wants to see, I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh whatever. No, Even you not pregnant like, in a bikini. I'm sorry. Pregnant yeah. bellies are pretty hot. <laughs> Market for everything. But yeah, pregnant women are super hot. Oh, I'm so grossed out right now. Uh, that, yeah. That's gonna, that's gonna have to do. Go hang out with your cats, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a Jake Pillen show until my guest, who I've been nothing but respectful, teases me about my cats. That's when we know it's over. All right, everybody, thank you. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. All right. Get a book. <laughs> Get a book. I'm Jenny. Right? That's the name of the book. Go get it now. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Jenny. Bye, guys.